You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Good morning, church. So the scripture reading, or passage rather, for today is uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 15. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on, go on into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we, was, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tyre, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And stay. And she prevailed upon us. These are the true words of the living God. Happy New Year. Good to see you all. Well done. <laughs> Got a better response than Christmas Day. It is great to see you. Uh, happy, happy, happy New Year. It uh, is a great um, moment of joy, actually, to begin the New Year with the church service, where we can stand before God and we can actually come before Him and, and consecrate ourselves and give this year to Him and, uh, as it were, lay ourselves on the altar. So we will be having a moment in time. Uh, A bit later, where we do exactly that, where we offer ourselves to God and offer this year uh, in all its beauty and with all its um, roses and thorns, uh, which are likely to to come our way. But we want to give it all to God and uh, do this as an act of of worship and of uh, praise to Him. Well, uh, I think out of the providence of God, the passage which has been chosen for us today, we are... Uh, in uh, lockstep with RHC Central and we are doing the same preaching calendar and uh, we are back in the book of Acts starting obviously at the beginning of the year and we are picking it up where we left off last year RHC and uh, we are looking at Acts chapter 16 which was just read for us and out of the providence of God one of the most 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 appropriate messages or sermon passages For New Year's Day is actually Acts chapter 16, so I am very excited about uh, some things which I hope uh, God will speak to us out of his word today. But before we get to the uh, scripture, I want to ask you a couple of questions about 2023. I know it's only a few hours old, but uh, how are you thinking about uh, 2023? So here are my three questions for you. Number one is where are you going in 2023? Where are you going in 2023? Number two, and granted there's some overlap with these questions, but uh, just bear with me for the moment. Number one, where are you going in 2023? Number two, what mission are you going to be on in 2023? Where are you going and what mission are you going to be on? And number three, my third question to you all, is how are you going to steer? How are you going to navigate? How are you going to steer? How are you going to steer your craft in 2023? Where are you going? What mission are you on? And how are you going to steer? And so uh, to kick us off, I thought we'd uh, borrow the words of Robert Frost. It's a famous poem. You probably have heard this many times, but in case you haven't, uh, it's a good one to hear for the first time. He wrote a poem called The Road Not Taken. So let me, uh, as you're thinking about my questions, let me read you this poem. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood. 
and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. It's kind of a cute poem, right? It's charming, it's New Year's Day, there's a guy out and he's ambling about a wood, it's a yellow wood, yellow trees I imagine, comes to a fork in the road, doesn't really know which way to go, it's all very leisurely and quaint, and then he's in two minds, left or right, which way do I go, and then he examines and he's, he's a bit, if you read it closely, he's a bit, there's a bit of ambiguity in the poem because he says they both looked equally well worn, but later he seems to say one was less traveled by, so there's a bit of internal contradiction there, he doesn't quite know. And there's also a bit of an air of resignation because he says maybe in the years to come, look I'm not going to come back this way, I've only got one shot here, I'm never going to come back to the beginning of 2023 ever again, and I might be thinking back on this with a sigh, that's the word that he used, who knows, who knows. Okay, so let's apply my three questions to Robert Frost's poem with all due respect. I love the poem by the way, but I'm just trying to make a point here. Okay, number one, where was he going? He didn't really have a destination in mind. He was just ambling. It was just a nice ambling stroll. Maybe that's you. Maybe you don't really know where you're going. Maybe you're just kind of ambling about life. Number two, what mission was the poet on? Well, there doesn't really seem to be a mission. That's all that evident. And to the contrary, he's kind of wafting around a little bit, quite happy to go this way or that way and sort of in two minds, really. doesn't really know where he's going. He's not really on a mission. How is he steering? How is he navigating? Well, it's a bit of a coin toss. He tries to do some analysis. He, it looks like they're both equally worn, but then he concludes maybe that the one was less traveled by. So he's, a bit, he's not that sure. So navigation skills, steering ability? Uh, well, the jury's out on that. How are we doing? In contrast, we have Acts chapter 16. We have Acts chapter 16, which is one of the great frameworks, I believe, in the scripture for helping us uh, answer questions like, where are we going, what kind of mission are we on, and how are we going to steer? So I want to guide us through some things, some principles that we learn, and I want to make two big points today. The first point is God guides. First point is God guides. Easy to remember, it's two words, God guides. The second point is God does. God guides, number one, and number two, God does. God guides and God does. And uh, hopefully by the end, this will become more clear. So let me, if you can turn with me to Acts chapter 16, let me just read the first little bit out, and this is point number one. God guides. God guides. So let me reread some of this, starting in verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, that's a recap. Let's look at the first half of the first verse. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And let's pause there. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's not really interesting if you don't know the context. So uh, let me put it to you like this. In chapter 13, a couple of chapters back, Paul and his team, now consist of Silas and Timothy, got sent out on a mission. And their mission was to tell people about Jesus and to start churches, to be a 
part of establishing churches. That was their mission that they were given in Acts chapter 13. And the Holy Spirit sends them out, and the church sends them out. So they're on a mission. Chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, they do their mission, and they kind of go around to an area, and they do exactly that. They get persecuted, but they preach the gospel. They tell people about Jesus. They live in the kingdom. They live and exemplify a Christian life, and they start and they plant churches. Then at the end of chapter 15, they come back to where they started. All right, because we don't have a map, and you're probably not that intimately familiar with uh, the geography that these people are talking about here, I'm going to give it to you in Singapore terms. Okay. Just work with me here for a moment, people. It's not to scale. I just want to emphasize that. They started at Changi Airport. Then they got sent out on their mission. Go for it, Paul and Silas and Timothy. And off they went. And they went on their mission. And do you know what? They they, they, they went. First point they went to was Passeris. And then to Tampines. And even to the metropolis of Sime. And when they got there, they spoke about Jesus and they started churches and they got everyone excited about the gospel. And this attracted some opposition and they, some terrible things happened to them, but they remained true. And then they circled on back to where they started, which was where? Changi Airport. Wow, you're a smart, smart, smart group of people. And then they recapped on how it had gone. Then, chapter 16, they go out again. Then they went to, where did they go? Phrygia and Galatia, they made it to Raffles City, City Hall. Isn't that incredible? This is, in other words, new territory. What does Phrygia and Galatia mean? New territory. They were going to new places. Are you going to new places this year? Are you on a mission this year? These people were, and off they went on a mission, and they got to new territory. They made it to City Hall. And when they got there, as they were going, they were on a mission. And what was their mission? Their mission in one word, Jesus. They wanted to tell people about Jesus, that he died for their sins, that Jesus was God, that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus came to save them, that Jesus came to save the whole creation, the whole planet, that Jesus came to take humanity and the cosmos into a new heavens and a new earth. And they started churches and they started communities which would live out the implications of being in Christ. That was their mission. Are you on such a mission? This is the challenging thought of the text. No one's asking you to leave your house or go to a foreign country yet. But you can be on a mission in your workplace, in your family. You too can be on a mission. You might not know exactly where you're going, but you can be on a mission. By the way, Paul and Silas and Timothy just took the green line. They just got on the MRT and they just went straight. This is how they're going. They get to City Hall, and you all know at City Hall or Raffles Place, shall we say, it intersects with what? The red line. Now you've got a decision. Are you going to go left and south, or are you going to go right and north? Well, let's read on. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Isn't that a very striking verse? Why would the Holy Spirit stop the word being preached Well, that's not quite correct, just seeing if you're awake. He stopped the word being preached in Asia. In other words, they got to Raffles Place, and the Holy Spirit said, don't go south to Marina Bay, financial. Don't go there. Don't go there. No problem. So they carried on a bit, and then they somehow got to Dobie Gort, because they're just doing the last thing that God had told them. You're on a mission, and we're just going in a straight line. We're kind of using our consecrated, sanctified common sense, some human strategy, some wisdom. We've got our instructions. Get out there on a mission. Tell people about Jesus. We're doing it as best as we can. Okay, we've got to know we're not going to Maria Bay, but we just need to keep on going. So it's not all just the Holy Spirit, right? It's in partnership with them. They're actually using some common sense and some wisdom and some strategy and and some logic. So they carry on, verse 7, and when they had come to Mysia, let's call it Dobie Gort. It's a a rough translation from the original Greek. (laughs) They attempted to go into Bithynia. Do you know what great people there are in Senkang? Thinking of you, Isaac, wherever you are. Or Haogang, or up northeast, right? And Dobie Gort, you can... You can get on the northeast line, you know, the purple line. That's another option. We can go up there. We are exploring new territory. We're on a mission for Jesus in 2023. We don't quite know where we're going, but it could be up there. It's not south. Anyway, 
So, but, this is halfway through verse 7, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. We've got two notes. Don't go left, don't go right. So they presume we're just going to keep on going. So they did. Verse 8, so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. Just because it rhymes, let's call it Chuas. They went down to Chuas. And when they got there, when it's, it's a port city, by the way. And one of the definitions of a port is there's a great big ocean in front of you. You can't go left, you can't go right. You keep doing the last thing God had told you to do, and then you bump into the sea. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. You kind of got some instructions from God, and you're on a mission, you're doing what you think you should. You've got two no's, and now you bump into the sea. Now what? Now what? What do you do next? Well, they're in Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Two doors closed. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing the last thing God asked you to do. Trust him. Use a bit of wisdom and some human strategy, some common sense. Work it out in team. And when you get to an ocean, God will tell you what to do next. And he'll open a door. This sort of happened to me once. 2017, I was working in a law firm. I was on a mission in the law firm, but I felt like God was calling me to another mission. To another mission. So I applied for another job. And the process was going well. So well, in fact, that they told me, you need to go and tell the managing partner of the law firm that you're going to resign so, so that we can explore this position further. So I did that. I went and I said, look, I'm going to leave the law firm. Something happened on the other side, and the position vaporized. Then I had to go back to the boss and say, oh, excuse me about the resignation letter, and I had to uh, steal it back off the desk. One door closed, okay? Can't go south. Then I applied for another job, and that was going really well. I was last man standing. I was the only candidate remaining, and uh, it, was, it was getting really to the zenith, you know, the, uh, the point where you kind of put pen to paper, and we had this meeting arranged for the day. On that day, the company changed hands. And that position vaporized. Okay, two doors closed. So I just kept on doing what I was doing. Got to the deep blue sea. Don't know what to do next. And then a job opportunity opened for me at RHC. Two doors closed. God will many times open a third. Here's the point. What is point number one? God guides. But I want to slightly restate the point. God guides, comma, especially when you're on a mission for him. God guides, of course, of course he guides. But God guides especially when you're on a mission for him. God guides especially when you're on a mission for him. Where are you going? What mission are you on? How are you going to steer? What I want to suggest to you is the most important question is, are you on a mission for him? Because if you are, he can steer you and he can guide you. If you're not, of course, he's gracious. He's going to help. He's loving. He's a good father. But the challenge of this passage is here are people who are sacrificially on a mission for Jesus. What about you? Are you on a mission for him? What does your mission for him look like this year? How are you going to preach his gospel? How are you going to stand for him? How are you going to live out the principles of being in Christ? How are you going to establish church? How are you going to build communities of grace? What is being asked of you by God? Are you on a mission for yourself or are you on a mission for the King of Kings? Whose behest do you stand at? Whose orders do you take? Are you following him or is he following you as it were? Are you leading him? Or are you trying to lead God? Or is God leading you? Because he is on a mission. He is on a mission of kindness and love and goodness and grace. If you're on a mission for him, you might not know where you're going. But you can trust that he's going to steer you and help you. This is the great challenge of this passage. 
jump to verse 10. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately, when Paul, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we, we, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us, plural, to preach the gospel to them. One more thing to say about how God guides is that often it's in team. One person got the vision here, Paul. We all agreed. By the way, this is the first time we meet Luke and Acts. It's the first time he uses we. He's been telling the story about Paul, and then suddenly it's we. So Luke obviously was in Troas, and then bumps into Paul, gets on the team. Now Luke is with Paul and the rest of them. And we concluded, yes, this is the mission we have to do. We're going to Macedonia. We're going to Macedonia. How does God guide us? Well, what have we seen so far? He wants to speak. He wants you to be on mission. He wants you to operate out of general principles. He wants you to use human wisdom and strategy and understanding. He also wants you to be open to the Holy Spirit. He wants you to obey the no's that he gives you. He wants to lead you. He wants to open doors for you. He also wants you to be in team. Do you know how exhilarating it is to be on a corporate mission together with others? You're invited into a collective mission. God has a personal mission for you in 2023. God also has a mission for us as a community as we seek to take his name into the world. All right. Point number one, God guides in brackets, especially those who are on a mission. Okay, point number two, God does, God does, God does. And when you are on mission for Jesus, you see the most incredible stuff. Supernatural, miraculous, powerful, wonderful God at work. And uh, so let's look at this in verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days. So, they're being guided by the Holy Spirit. Don't go there, don't go there, open door here. Once they get their next set of instructions, their next directives, they then apply human wisdom, strategy, consecrated common sense. Because we're in Macedonia. Macedonia is this big region. Where? Which city? They go to Samothrace. Is it there? Nah, I don't think so. They go to Neapolis. Is it there? Nah, I don't think so. Must be Philippi. Why Philippi? Well, we're told it's a leading city of that area. So they're using some human mouse, some wisdom here, some strategy. Well, it's the leading city. It's this hub. Call it Singapore, if you like. It's this critical place geographically. This would be a great place for Christian work to happen. And uh, that's where they target. Some background about uh, Philippi, by the way. You remember, well, I don't know if you remember, none of us were there. Brutus killed Caesar. You, you remember that story, right? He backstabbed him, or front stabbed him, whichever way it was. And uh, he was with Cassius. And then uh, Caesar's adopted son, Augustus, Caesar Augustus. Then they, these, wars, these factions had a big fight. Caesar Augustus and Mark Antony fought against Cassius and Brutus. And the battle was at Philippi. The final battle was at Philippi. That's just a historical anecdote to paint the picture that the true Caesar, the true king of the universe, confronts his opponents. He confronts the darkness. And this is happening here at Philippi. And you're invited into that, as it were, metaphorically. You're invited into this mission of God to push back the frontiers of darkness and to stand for the true king. By the way, by the way, many people in Singapore I've come across think of Christianity as a European religion. But here, it's the other way around. It was first in Asia. These folks are coming from Asia. And here in chapter 16, getting to Philippi, Macedonia, is the first time Christianity reached Europe. This is, this is, this is quite, quite a moment. How did Christianity get to Europe? It's here in Acts chapter 16. If you follow God and are on mission with him, you, you will be part of historic, incredible, wonderful things. Anyway, getting back to the text. So they get to Philippi. Uh, we remained there a few days, verse 13, and remained in the city some days, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, 
where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. Now, their strategy in the past was to go from town to town to town, pretty much in a straight line. And they would target the synagogues because those people had Jewish background and they had some knowledge about God, imperfect knowledge, and they came to, as it were, speak about Christ, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So that was a good strategic place for them to go. They get to Philippi, there's no synagogue. To have a synagogue, you need minimum 10 men to form a quorum. This is back in the day. There weren't enough Jews, male Jews, to form a synagogue in the city of Philippi. So some of the faithful Jewish ladies had a little prayer group, a little prayer meeting. So Paul gets there again. He's using human strategy and wisdom. Where's the synagogue? There's no synagogue in Philippi. Oh, but word on the street has it that some Jewesses, some ladies who are Jews, have a little prayer group, and they meet at this picturesque little spot on the bend of the river. If you go out the city, take a left, you see this beautiful tree under the tree in the shade. That's where they go and pray. Paul targets them. The Holy Spirit is guiding and leading. So they use a bit of strategy here and a bit of connection and networking uh, to get to speak to them. Verse 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple goods who was a worshipper of God. All right, some things about Lydia. Number one, she's from Thyatira. Now, you probably don't know where Thyatira is, so let me tell you. It's Marina Bay Financial Center. She came from the area that Paul was told not to go to. God was going to bring her to where he was sending Paul, and the two of them converge. When you're on mission for God, you will see extraordinary things. So here he is speaking to an Asian in Europe. That's how the gospel gets to Europe. What else do you need to know? She's a dealer in purple cloth or purple goods. The emperors used to wear purple. Purple was this luxury brand. She was a wealthy lady. She would trade in merchandise of expensive stuff. She was a businesswoman. She was obviously good at what she did. We know a bit later in the story that she's got a huge house, so she's well off. What else do we know about Lydia? She was a worshiper of God. What does that mean? Let me decode it for you. It means she used to be a Gentile who switched to being a Jew. God has been working on this woman for years. She was in her city of Thyatira. Something happens and she, has a, she feels called to the God of the Jews. So she changes religion. Stops being a pagan. She starts worshipping this God. She moves city. God is, is working in her, working in her. She then joins a little prayer group of Jewish ladies in foreign city in Macedonia. And then Paul comes to her and speaks the gospel. You've got to see the incredible threads of God's artistry here as he's weaving the story. When you're on mission for God, you cannot script the stuff. You cannot make it up. But when you're on track with him, when you are tracking with The Holy Spirit, when He is leading you, He will start leading you and and crossing paths with remarkable people who He's been working on all the time. We can trust Him. It's on a need-to-know basis. We might not know where we're going, but we let Him steer us so long as we're on mission. And then these beautiful words in the middle of verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. One thing leads to another. God opens her heart. She becomes a Christian. She puts her faith in Jesus Christ. She repents of her sins. She turns to God. It's like God does open heart surgery right there in front of them all. He's calling her. He's summoning her. He's beckoning her into his kingdom. And she responds with faith and repentance. She becomes a Christian. But it doesn't stop there. She then goes home and she tells her family. Not only her family, but the household would encompass the the, the folks who were working in the house as well. They come to faith as well. Then as a declaration, she then gets baptized straight away. And the members of her, her family as well. This is how the gospel gets to Europe. It's quite a radical story. We don't really know, but I like to imagine she got baptized at the bend in the river where they used to meet. Why not? Wouldn't it be great to find that out one day? 
She becomes baptized. But it doesn't stop there. She then immediately puts her faith into action. And she says, I'm Capital Land. I, I have a venue for you. Come to my house. Come to my house. And Paul gets to the house, and we're going to see next week, that uh, a church gets planted in her living room. When you're on mission for Jesus, remarkable, incredible things can happen. Why? Because point number two, God does. God does. You cannot open anyone's heart. You cannot. You cannot. Frankly, you can't even open your own heart. But the Holy Spirit can. And so if you've been praying for friends, praying for family members, we're talking here about a God who is all-powerful who can send a lady from another country to another country, work on her heart for years, line her up at the perfect moment, send some other guy, convert that man, turn him around radically, put him on mission. And the next thing you know, someone is in the kingdom of, kingdom of Jesus. God can open anyone's heart. So to end, I want to read two things. Uh, the first is a testimony about a man who, uh, in his words, had a similar experience where God opens his heart. And so I want to read it and stir you all. And I want us to all put our faith out that uh, we would have experience of uh, being in conversations and helping other people to understand the gospel of Jesus. That this year, 2023, we'd be on a mission for Jesus. ECP, we're on a mission for Jesus. We're going to take his name to as many people as we can, as respectfully, as dutifully, and as joyfully as possible. And uh, let's trust that the Lord would use us. We are small. We, our pay grade is very low. We are useless. We are feeble. But we have a mighty God who can lead us and who can guide us and who can open people's hearts. So let me inspire you with uh, a testimony like this. I remember the night... And almost the very spot on the hilltop where my soul opened out, as it were, into the infinite. And there was a rushing together of the two worlds, the inner and the outer. It was deep calling unto deep, the deep that my own struggle had opened up within being answered by the unfathomable deep outside of me, reaching beyond the stars. I stood alone with him who had made me, and all the beauty of the world and love and sorrow and even temptation I did not seek him, but felt the perfect unison of my spirit with his. The ordinary sense of things around me faded. For the moment, nothing but an ineffable joy, a joy too great to utter, an exaltation remained. It is impossible fully to describe the experience. It was like the effect of some great orchestra when the separate notes have melted into one swelling harmony that leaves the listener conscious of nothing, save that his soul is being wafted upwards and almost bursting with its own emotion. The perfect stillness of the night was thrilled by a more solemn silence. The darkness held a presence that was all the more felt because it was not seen. I could not any more have doubted that he was there than that I was. Indeed, I felt myself to be, if possible, the less real of the two. This is God who is powerful, who deals in spiritual ways and spiritual places, and who can open people's souls and who can save them. And uh, finally, a prayer from St. Augustine. If you are here today or listening, And you want to become a Christian. You feel, as I've been speaking, that God is knocking on the door of your heart. God is calling you, summoning you, beckoning you into his kingdom. Then you can join with me and pray this prayer by allowing him to open your soul, open your heart, so that you might receive Jesus Christ and his salvation. This is how Augustine prayed. O Lord my God, tell me what you are to me. Say to my soul... I am your salvation. Say it so that I can hear it. My heart is listening, Lord. Open the ears of my heart and say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let me run toward this voice and seize hold of you. Do not hide your face from me. Let me die so that I may see it. For not to see it would be death to me 
indeed. Shall we pray? Mighty God, we stand before you today so encouraged by the story of Paul and his friends, so encouraged by the mission that they were on to speak of you and to make you known. Lord, would you help us to be on mission with you? Jesus, we thank you for saving us. Thank you that you opened our heart, just as you opened Lydia's heart. Lord, we want to pray for the city of Singapore today. We ask that many people would come into your kingdom. Many people would know you. Many people would hear you. Many people would have the sensation that you are calling them, speaking to them, summoning them. Lord, we don't know exactly where we're going in 2023. But we do want to commit ourselves today to being on a mission for you. Lord, would you guide us? Would you steer us? Would you give us sanctified common sense and wisdom and strategy? Help us to be credible and relevant to the people of the city. But Lord, thank you that it's all up to you, ultimately. Thank you that you're the one who moves, who blows wherever you please. Thank you that you can send people from foreign countries. You can unlock continents. You can change the destiny of nations. You can turn the most stubborn heart towards you. You can melt hearts of stone. Oh God, we want to see your power this year, in 2023. We want to see you move. We want to see you do remarkable, radical, incredible things. We want to be a part of it, Lord. Would you help us, Lord? Would you help us, Lord? Would you keep your eyes closed for a little bit longer? I think it would be wonderful if we as a people collectively and jointly stood before the Lord of all the universe today. 2023 is a few hours old. It's got hope. It's got promise. It's got opportunity. It's got danger. It's got risk. It's got challenge. It's got heartache, all these things coming our way. Our best, best, best move right now is to commit ourselves to God. We don't have to conjure this up. We don't have to make this super spiritual. And yet, what a profound thing is if as a body we could jointly lay our hearts and our lives on His altar today. So why don't we do this collectively as an act of worship? I'm going to read some words from Romans chapter 12. And can I ask you, for your part, figuratively as we lock hands and join arms today as this group called ECP, whatever that means, can I ask us to unite as we offer ourselves to God? Let's lay 2023 on the altar so that whatever happens in the future of this year, we can look back to that moment, that moment where we stood before God and we committed and dedicated our lives and our 2023s to Him. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, in view or in light of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Why don't you offer your body on the altar today as an act of worship to the King. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, offering your body on the altar comes with a promise that God will help you discern what His will is for your life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Would you like to know what the good, pleasing and perfect will of God is? The step is to offer your year to Him. Lord, here we stand. We offer ourselves to You. We say, show us your will, O God. Lead us, guide us, steer us, navigate us, direct us. 
Lead us on, O oh God. We want to follow you. We want to follow you, Lord. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.